Recording. Three, two. Hi, I'm Robert Stanley of the Right to Reason podcast, and I took a left at the valley. Gotta love that voice. Do, do so. I know we shouldn't have to scream that we're atheists, you know. We don't have non-astrologers and all that. But with the religious people taking over the world, I mean, we can either speak up or be pushed into a corner. I'm proud to be an atheist, a skeptic, a non-believer, an infidel, a heathen. I call it how I see it. You just call it faith and unsubstantiated claims That's something to be ashamed I'm an atheist Ah, uh, coming at you from Viking Hill, this is Left of the Valley. My name is Kevin, and I'm so large that when I stand on the street corner, the cops yell, Break it up! Uh, that brings me back to my childhood of, Your mama's so fat! <laughs> <laughs> when Your she mama. has her own secret. Oh, duck. <laughs> Your podcaster is so fat! <laughs> <laughs> Joining me as usual is a team that likes to buy expensive suits, they just look cheap on us. Um, speak for yourself. I look great in a suit. <laughs> <laughs> she had a perfectly wonderful day, but this today just isn't it. <laughs> Nancy. <laughs> but it's early yet. Yeah, it's early. One never knows. <laughs> and he looked up his family tree and found out he was the sap. Scott. I'm just a drip. <laughs> I'm just a drip. <laughs> <laughs> and she'll tell you that cleanliness becomes more important when godliness is unlikely. Can it's I just, uh, can both of them be unimportant? Oh, probably. I, I don't like cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I don't clean. <laughs> and she'll tell you that if you want to guarantee, buy a toaster. Yes. Kirsten. I don't. Four slice. I don't get that joke. Four slice. <laughs> Four slice. I don't that. get it, guys. <laughs> get a toaster, <laughs> guys. Welcome back. Today we're gonna have a very interesting show. Uh, we're gonna be talking to Ethan Siegel again oh. <laughs> about the science of Star Trek. But first, let's do a bit of chit chat. I love science, guys. Everybody loves science. Science, uh, you know what? One of the best lines is from Bill Nye. Science is the best idea we ever had. Oh, I think yes. it's a great line. I bought her a science game for Christmas. Yes. Oh, cool. It's so fun. We'll have to play it later. I feel smart when I play it. <laughs> Nancy. Yes, sir. I'm sure you have an opinion on this. Uh, we have the Marches for Our Lives on March 24th. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, know what where... opinion would you like? I've got so many. <laughs> you know, I've got so many, I've got a load of darts. I can just throw them and an opinion will be hit, hit and I can just go at it. In over 800 cities across the U.S. and across the world. Yes. It was quite the success. Anybody participate in one of them? No. Uh, no, I didn't. What are you pointing No, my, uh, my sister-in-law did. So it was very interesting. What I what I thought was uh, was kind of uh, disturbing to me, though, is a lot of conservative websites also organized counter protests, and people showed up at counter protests with their AR-15, and uh, they also use a lot of propaganda. For example, there was this uh, couple of pictures of running around of Emma Gonzalez. Um, you 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 appear to see her with an umbrella about to strike a car, but people don't realize that that's actually an old picture of Britney Spears. <laughs> You know, what you went I it's actually pretty funny that they would pull something like that. I, yeah. I don't think anyone should be surprised about the the backlash that's coming from the right because after all these decades, it finally looks as though these young people are going to accomplish what the, the Congress never has been able to do, and that is bring some common sense uh, gun legislation yeah. finally to the country and reduce the power of the NRA. And they cannot... Um, go after these kids on the basis of th- th- what the merit saying. of, of their, their movement. They have to go after them. They don't have to, but they've sunk low enough to go after them by attacking them personally. Yeah. And that, it, 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 there's absolutely no... Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, um, what kind of a person are you when you're attacking there, kids? There's well, yeah. no benefit to the NRI or to the right to do this because it's only making them look yes, worse. Exactly. Except and, the and they're base, looking of pretty course, low and, right now. You know. yeah. Well, you know, there's also all these memes going around saying, you know, kids shouldn't be in charge of our laws. Yeah. You're right. You're right. The, the, the Congress and all that should be in charge of the laws. But the thing is, when you have a gun control that is supported by 90% of the population exactly. and it's still not going through Congress, yeah. then there's a problem. And I don't blame those kids for standing up. They're, I mean, they have freaking gun drills in school in America. I yeah, remember fire scary. drills. Can you imagine going through a gun drill? I, I just wouldn't go to school. I'd be like, like, um, guys, well, I'm going to get homeschooled. We're not, we're not old enough. Nancy's old enough to remember this, though, uh, having the, the uh, nuclear drills. 
where if you thought there was a nuclear attack, everybody well, would crawl oh, under yeah. the desk. Nancy was part of the Manhattan Project to begin with. <laughs> you know, well, no, no, I'm just saying that she remembers no, that. No, you did. Because we're too young and, to remember not that. Drop, it wasn't drop, drop and it cover. Was, it was drop and cover. Drop it was and get cover. under your desk. Yeah, you yeah. Went, under, mm-hmm. went under the desk. Or get into right? and oh, yeah. a And so fridge. the kids, we, we just, they're responding <laughs> to a threat, right? They're responding well, yeah. to a threat. But the whole reason they have the threat is because of the lack of, of control of firearms in the states. Yeah. I mean, it's the only country in the world where you, you, you have to have mandatory gun drills because well, the school might become a target. Well, when, well, when, the, the, NR, when the NRA decided to, that they wanted to have the best Congress money could buy, that's when the, the, the problems really was, were exacerbated because the NRA throws millions of dollars and helps elect the, mm-hmm, the mm-hmm. legislatures and then they're yeah. beholden and these kids realize that they can cut through that and it's going to be very damning for a lot of these legislators who are going to be voted out midterm Apparently. and there sorry i'm jumping here for a sec of course but um you were talking earlier about that they were saying like kids shouldn't be in charge of our laws but these aren't like 12 year old kids these are no, these are don't. teenagers who are going to be voting in the next few years and and there are there are some countries that when you're 16 you can start voting. Yeah, I've heard some of these kids talk on the news. And like they they know they aren't kids who are just like, oh yeah, I'm gonna smoke a, a joint and go like hang out in like the back of the the school lot. Like these are kids who who are organized and who yeah. are driven and who understand what they're talking about they aren't like yeah. but even if they were kids that say I'll go in the back of the school and smoke a joint yeah. that still doesn't mean they don't have a right to totally. voice the fact that guess what? I'm there coming are some to school and I'm scared for my life well it's it's not as though these kids are in charge of the laws they're starting they're they're motivating a moral point of view in a moral movement so that um, they, they, they cut through the, the corrupt I hate to say corruption but they they oh. cut through what what's been paralyzing uh, Congress for for a long mm-hmm. for a long time? Yeah. So hey, I've I've, I've heard these the I've heard these kids on the news, uh, the ones they've interviewed, and they sound pretty on the ball. Yeah. Oh, they, well, they are. They probably could run the country more to, more <laughs> than the are. average voter. Well, better than. Yeah. Oh, I'm not going to say it. Okay. <laughs> well, speaking of Congress, did you guys find, uh, know that they discovered a new monkey? Really? Yes, they discovered a. a oh. It's in uh, Myanmar. And it's the, they call it the snub nose monkey. Uh, the Latin name is Rhinopithecus strikeri. It's in the northeast of the country near China. Is, sound, is it Myanmar? Myanmar. Myanmar. I think it's Myanmar? pronounced Myanmar. I okay, think well, it's Myanmar. That country that is having yeah, a whole yeah. bunch of problems. <laughs> I think yeah, there's one a of those one of those countries. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, um, I can go with that. It's it's uh, the 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 they get the name because uh, the, uh, the they call him the st- snub nose monkey because apparently the uh, the monkey's got a very peculiar nose. It's kind of like upturned nostrils. When you take a picture of it, it's almost like you know. Imagine your nose. Imagine if you were slice it off, you would have the na- nasal cavity Weird. and it, it curves up a bit. And they're also nicknamed they're, they're starting to nickname him the sneezing monkey because when it rains, the nose kind of gets plugged up. And the oh. monkey starts sneezing. Well, I was gonna I was gonna say that would be rather like having your nostrils. Level or upturned, yeah, would be rather hard when it's inclement weather. Because, exactly. What's yeah. the evolutionary reason for that? They don't know at this point. It's a new, they've just discovered this monkey, right? Huh. They've estimated so far the population to be about three hundred that they know oh, of. Oh, that's so sad. So, well, I mean, it's a new, they might discover more. They true, just, very they, true. They just found the new. Did they find it in an area that researchers haven't been able to investigate very much? Well, they, it's it's. Like I said, it's between these two countries near China, um, and of course, you know, there's there's starting to get development in that area as well. Yeah. So the the population is uh, maybe declining because of deforestation. Yeah, something like very that, true. Right? So anyway, that's a story we'll have to follow. Here's another story: Malala Yousafzai. Remember love, her? Oh my gosh! This, Remember Malala? This, this person is like my hero. I love her so much. She returned to Pakistan after six years after being shot wow. in the face by the Taliban. Mm-hmm. And uh, of course, she won the Nobel Prize in 2014. Remember that? I bought her book. She is now 20. <laughs> Seriously? Wow. Yeah, she oh finished. She finished her studies in the UK. And I'm not wow. sure if she's gonna, she's going to stay in Pakistan or not. But you know, wow. let it go. Uh, she's quite an inspiration. Uh, locally, um, don't know if you guys remember um, Andre Bissonnette. This is the 28 year old who shot and killed six people in Quebec City Mosque in January yeah. 2017. Uh-huh. Uh, he changed his plea to guilty. It was a surprise change. 
And he, he said he's really sorry. He says, quote, I was a person who was carried away by fear and a horrible form of despair. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so he's changed his plea and he's just going to. It's really interesting to know, like, what changed his mind to, like, realize, like, what he did. Well, I, I, I think. And I th- why he did it. I think it's simply information, right? I mean. Probably. These, these people, I think, like, uh, like Bissanet and all that, he's obviously a guy who fell prey to uh, the right wing propaganda. You know, a yeah. Muslim around every corner and they all have a bomb strapped to them and all that. He fell for that and he acted on it and he. Created a it's lot just of harm. a good thing that yeah. victims' families don't have to go through all of that. In a well, yeah, trial. that was one of the reasons too. He, yeah. he said he didn't want to drag the family through the court and relive all that that painful mm-hmm. memory. So, good for him in a way, I guess. Hey, you guys, remember Mad Mike Hughes? Yes, he finally did his flight. Yeah, yes, I saw it. I saw it. <laughs> Did he hit the dome? <laughs> he flew his steam-powered <laughs> rocket at about 1,875 feet. Wow. Oh and he deployed two parachutes, and he came back down. <laughs> so If he keeps going at that rate, we'll have warp drive by 2025. Yeah. Oh, exactly, exactly. And now the next step for him is he apparently is going to run for governor. <laughs> Which state is he in? Of what I'm not state? sure. I'm not sure. Oh, Where does my. he live? Do you, do you know what? I can't remember. I, I don't. I, I don't have it here in the notes. I mean, I can't remember what state. But remember, he had the, the problem with the the uh, yeah. Bureau of Land Management. Then he it, had to go on private land, it will and be then the an second attempt run. failed. I'm I'm looking forward to the debates. Flat earther. <laughs> <laughs> Flat earther for governor. Probably believes in chemtrails too. Of course. Uh, he probably believes in every conspiracy theory. Speaking of morons, Doug Ford. Oh gosh, do we? Uh, he was uh, he was elected. Is he he is was he elected. Actually the moron. I thought he kept tried to keep his brother out of. Well, out you know, he's he's the yeah. lesser moron of the two, I guess. Uh, he was elected the head of the Ontario Conservatives, uh, and um, but he's not like. Is he like actually like in government, or are they still running? No, he is in government. Oh, that's so gross. But I mean, he's not. He's not in power. He's the opposition. Okay, right now, right? that's good. Okay, so. <laughs> Uh, he was responding to the 2018 Ontario budget, and he said that if he was elected, he would cut the CBC. Okay. Now, the problem with that is the CBC is a federal thing. Yeah. <laughs> and he's running for the, Ontar- <laughs> the Ontario Conservatives. So I don't know where he doesn't understand that he's got no power Gosh. over this. And the voters in Ontario go to the polls in two months. Guys, just just don't. Well, they, are, <laughs> they are the center of the universe. Just so don't. I suppose if... Well, if the, they the wanted Ontario- to cut the CBC off, then it would fall apart in the rest of the country because Ontario is the center of the universe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, I hate to say it, but he's got a very good chance of going yeah. in because they're very unhappy with their current government in Ontario. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, very locally, uh, there's a woman named Carrie Simpson. Oh. Why do I know that name? She's oh. a Christian activist ah, right here in the I valley. She's now. culture guard. Oh, yes, no. she is. And she is sued uh, multiple levels of the justice system for $11 million in defamation lawsuit over 15 years against the late radio host Rafe Mayer. Mm-hmm. Why? Rafe, well, because at the time, um, at the time in 1999, Rafe Mayer criticized Simpson, calling her a bigot and referring to Nazi Germany and the KKK when she campaigned against books in Surrey school depicting gay couples. <laughs> so, uh, so she's been she's been going through the court ever since. Um, Rafe Mayer passed away like last year, I believe, mm-hmm. and uh, the. Uh, her 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 case has been dismissed as good. an abuse of process. Actually, oh good, good. and but and they're making her pay for all the. She's still, she's still and there's some question as to what she's doing with the money. She's um, she'll she's probably come after work. me if she ever yeah. hears this. The Supreme, Supreme Court ordered her to actually pay the cost of the defense as well. Yeah. and right now she's currently campaigning against Soji. Oh, I'll, I'll say this: I think she's a piece of work. Yeah. I think she's a bitch. I think she's an idiot. <laughs> In your okay? opinion. In my opinion, she's stupid. Well, how's that? She can't get me on defamation on any of that because I didn't say she is. I said I yeah. think she is. Yeah. She so uh, stick that in your she, pipe and smoke it, lady. The comments of yeah. Scott are actually they are the, the opinion of the left of the Valley crew. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, How did that happen? <laughs> oh. All right, Nancy, oh you got a top ten for us? I sort of. Sort of? <laughs> sort of. Well, in honor of April Fool's Day, Ooh. which is coming up tomorrow. Can I, I just say to... I hate April Fool's, guys? Yeah, I, I hate it so much. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. 
Easter Sunday. I know, it's amazing. April, and April, April Fools. Fools. Wow. Wow. It's like it was meant to be. I it's know. like, <laughs> my mind is blown. Yeah, parents have been waiting. Everything happens at one Passover, Easter, April Fools, all the all the goods. Spring is sprung, so it's a, <laughs> it's a it's a chock full weekend. So I I went to find the top ten April Fools jokes, but if I went or hoaxes. But it's, it, it takes too long to go through all 10 of them. So I'm going to just pick out some of the ones that I think are pretty good, ending up with what is considered to be the best April Fool's joke of all time. So starting with, uh, with one of the ones that are kind of near the bottom, sort of like a n- number 10, was... On April 1st in 1992, National Public Radio's Talk of the Nation revealed that Richard Nixon, in a surprise move, was running for president again, (laughs) and that his new campaign slogan would be, I didn't do anything wrong, and I won't do it again. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) So, Uh. accompanying this announcement on NPR were audio clips of Nixon actually delivering a candidacy speech. And listeners responded to the announcement. They were just, you know, absolutely a, a lot of, of, of uh, um, pushback uh, on that. That he, he would really? even dare to do that. So the NPR got a flood of calls that expressed shock and outrage, and they were just really horrible. <laughs> Everybody was was horribly upset. And only during the second half of the show did the host, who at that time was a, a really good host called John Hockenberry at the, at the time with NPR, he revealed that the announcement was a practical joke and that Nixon's voice had been impersonated by comedian Rich Little. But that really got very, to people. Very, very good. It, it really got to people. So that was really, I, really funny. I I don't know if if I found out. I mean, back then that Nixon wanted to re. I I think I if I was an American, I'd want to vote for him. <laughs> I'm sure there were people that did. And you know, if Nixon if Nixon were were around now, yeah, and wanted to run, I would have to vote for him just because. <laughs> Because he's not Trump. <laughs> well, anything's got to be better, and he's not. He's not our. You know what? Nixon could run in Canada, oh, and no. I'd vote for him. No, oh, no, how, no. how time, <laughs> The times will push us to actually wanting Nixon to return. It really tells you about because the current. Because not necessarily. No, 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 damn! No. Damn it all! <laughs> Please uh, tell me you have. Tell these. me that's. Tell me that's an April Fool's joke. <laughs> tell, tell me, okay. Tell me you have the spaghetti treat. Okay, yeah. wait a minute. We have, like uh, Trudeau back to. It, sorry, Nancy. I'm interrupting your top ten. Yes, you are. But, <laughs> but Trudeau, you got to admit, Nixon was at least more professional than Trudeau is. Different times. You can't measure well, the same thing. It, it, professionalism and and. And, and morals and ethics don't necessarily... I mean, you can be very professional, but not necessarily be right. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I that think is. Trudeau's yeah. a numpty, okay? Sorry. A numpty that's or a, dumpty? Numpty. That's right. Numpty. Okay. This one, you'd almost, you, you almost have to read it to hear it, but I think it's funny anyway. April 1977, The Guardian in, in the UK published a special seven-page supplement devoted to a small republic that they called San Serif. It was a, they said it was a small republic said to consist of several semicolon-shaped islands located in the Indian Ocean. And a series of articles affectionately described the geography and culture of this obscure nation, and it said that the two main islands were uppercase and lowercase. <laughs> and it's the yeah. capital, the capital of the entire country was Bodini. <laughs> and, uh, Bodoni? Is it Bodoni? I yeah. think it's Bodoni. And, and Bodoni. And the leader was General Pica. <laughs> so the Guardian's phones rang all day as readers wanted more information about this idyllic holiday spot, and only a few noticed that everything about the island was somehow named after printer's terminology. <laughs> so the success of the Very home, well done. And the flag yeah. was Comic Sans. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so the Brits loved, the Brits just love this, and um, it, it's, it's been published from, from time to time. Now, that it really is looks, awesome. It, yeah, it's really cute because the uppercase was spelled C-A-I-S-S-E. So it, oh, very good. Very yeah. yeah. good. So it, 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 it really, they, they did it They did it very well. And the font on their passport is very different, too. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
this this is this is kind of cute. Um, the eruption of Mount Edgecombe. This was Edgecombe. April 1974. The residents of Sitka, Alaska, woke to a disturbing sight. Clouds of black smoke were rising from the crater of Mount Edgecombe, the long dominant volcano. Um, that, that was in the area, and people spilled out of their homes into the streets, and they thought, oh my God, they're terrified that it was active and might erupt. But luckily it turned out that uh, man, not nature, was responsible for the smoke, and a local practical joker, and the only reason that I'm reading this whole thing was because the practical joker's name was Porky Bicker. Oh my gosh! <laughs> you know that's better than the joke. You know to have the guy oh. have the joke. Porky. That Bicker. is that's a pretty good joke. It is. That, that sounds like something I would do. Yeah. That's, well, <laughs> well, if you could afford it, because what he did was he flew hundreds of old tires into the volcano's <gasps> um, crater and, and lit them and up. Then lit them on fire. <laughs> right. And, and according to local legend, when Mount St. Helens erupted six years later, a Sitka resident wrote to Bicker to tell him, this time you've gone too far. <laughs> <laughs> they blamed it on him. <laughs> okay, so now let's do the number one. This is going to put a smile on, on Kevin's face for sure. The number one best joke uh, or hoax of all time is the Swiss spaghetti. Oh uh, yes, yes, oh, this is beautiful. Good. Are you familiar with that? Yes, I've yeah, watched the article. <laughs> I've watched the article on it. I've read about it. It's so sweet. It was it's featured like, in our, our, day, our, our, our it, it really is this sweet. day in history as well. Yeah, um, just for those people who, who may not be familiar with it, it um, the BBC in 1957 um, had a show called Panorama, and on the the show they uh, announced that due to a very mild winter and the virtual elimination of the dreaded spaghetti weevil <laughs> Swiss farmers were enjoying a bumper spaghetti crop and it accompanied the announcement with footage of uh, Swiss peasants pulling strands of spaghetti down from trees <laughs> it was awesome <laughs> it, it was, was awesome. absolutely and, and awesome spaghetti tree. Yeah, and during that time awesome. people weren't all that uh, familiar with spaghetti and so they actually <laughs> bought into it and people called the BBC wanted to know how they could grow their own spaghetti trees and the BBC would reply well just put a sprig of spaghetti in a tin of tomato sauce and hope for the best <laughs> So later, you know, they they had to admit that um, there there was no such thing as this. Oh, it was so well done, harvest. though. Yeah, but it remained um, by far the most oh. highly acclaimed April Fool's hoax. How ever. incredible to think, you know, you, you get you hear that from the BBC and you just look at your strand of spaghetti, spaghetti and, and, your, and your tomato sauce just sitting up by the windowsill and you think, God, I'm an idiot. <laughs> yeah, checking every day, when is it going to grow, when are the roots going to grow into a tree? I'm going to have oh. my own spaghetti. The thing is, though, wouldn't, wouldn't the tomato sauce, like, make it all goopy and then it would slowly, like, sink? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just It's so rooting, guys. I wonder how you qualify a sprig of spaghetti. <laughs> oh, one, one of the pranks I, I, I remember when I used to drive truck and I was driving down to Seattle and I remember the local DJs I forget the radio station but they, they threw out this alert saying there was a leak of dihydrogen monoxide in, yes, the, in, the, yes. in the Seattle port Yes, and people to stay huge, away stay off leak. your boat and don't go swimming leak. and people started panicking <laughs> Dihydrogen it, it monoxide, it all the way which into is the H2O, ditches. Right? It was in the sewage system. Uh, good Lord, it got everywhere. Yeah, they, <laughs> they, 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 they had to apologize for a leak of dihydrogen monoxide. It's like, yeah, oh, my yeah, The harbor was full of it. I've heard of that one. Well, there's actually <laughs> it might a even website. Be in your tabs, Believe it or not, guys. dihydrogen monoxide, there's a, a DHMO website, uh, .org. It was started in 2007. And it started back in the 80s. And apparently it was a kid who started this as a school project to show how gullible people mm, are. Mm -hmm. And he he brought up... Well, the guy who started the website in 2007 actually went as far as to create satellite websites that you can click on the links in the website and goes to these satellite ones. And it's a big conspiracy theory on DHMO, mm. how they're hiding it in our sewage. And it's, mm. in the, it's, in the, it's responsible for the most... Damage to personal property ever. <laughs> DHMO, yes. You are you are gonna lose so much property because of this this substance that the government is putting in everything. And 
Oh, uh, you just go to dhmo.org. Yeah, and then oh follow gosh. the sites and read it. It was all a prank. The sunny water is a front. The day <laughs> that it was put out, there was a petition signed by over 8,000 people the day it was put out to ban DHMO, which, by the way, is water. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, you can't really ban water. Yeah, well, anybody, we kind of need it. Any one of our listeners who has been part of or has listened or read about a, uh, listened to or read about a really good hoax, let us know. We love those kinds of, we love those kinds of things. Yeah, so, pranks are, yeah, pranks are you, One of the simplest pranks I ever pulled off, and it's, it's such a simple prank, but it, uh, my dispatch at the time you know he had the the phone and and the console there and what i did is i took a piece of scotch tape and i taped the receiver button (laughs) so when he picked up the phone there was no dial tone so for 20 minutes he's looking at the phone thinking there's something wrong with the line he calls administration from upstairs the big boss are coming downstairs so 20 minutes they're goofing around with the phone until somebody notices a piece of scotch tape Oh and then for God. two weeks oh. after that, the, the guy's name was John. For two weeks after that, he's accusing every driver <laughs> of trying to sabotage his phone. You are mean. Until I walked in, I said, John. He says, hey, what's up, Kevin? He says, I hear you having issues with your phone. He looks at me and says, you. <laughs> it was you. <laughs> well done. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It was so simple. A piece of scotch tape. So Sometimes the simple ones are the best. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. I don't really like pranks. I have too bad of anxiety. <laughs> I'm just no. like, oh uh, no. I'm I'm not very good. I'm more I'm I'm more one of those people that does the prank and it goes too far. Like the guy with the volcano. That's my style of prank. <laughs> and I actually caused a NORAD scare when I was in the military. Seriously? Uh well because we we put a smoke bomb under a guy's car. And I probably oh. shouldn't even be telling this because I almost went to jail for it. <laughs> We put a smoke canister. You know the smoke canisters? They, they make the... Yeah, so we had the smoke canister under the guy's car. He caught us doing it, but he thought we were tying stuff under his car like the Just Married prank. He was leaving the military and going to university. So he drives... Now, we're on a submarine hunting base. So the base operations, he had to drive right by base operations to get out of the airfield. And base operations is all top secret. So imagine now this car has a three-minute cold smoke on it. It's blowing orange smoke like huge quantities of orange smoke and he's driving around and our whole squadron was out watching they were laughing he drives by base operations and then on the perimeter road around the runway he drops the cold smoke on the side of the road and phones us and says listen the cold smoke's on the side of the road you better go get it it was right by the ammo dump so i'm out picking i'm out picking up parachuters i was i was we were search and rescue i'm picking up the sartex parachuting and I look across and I see an MP vehicle, a military police vehicle, pull up to the corner of the runway. And I went, uh-oh. <laughs> and then I watch another military police vehicle and they literally cordoned the road off. To either side. And I'm watching and, I'm, and then I watch the explosives ordinance uh, fan pull in and I went, oh my God. I head back to the squadron. It's got no. the terrorists. So, so what, yeah, what ended up happening? It was a very long day. It was a very bad <laughs> day. <laughs> No, there, was, really? there was military police everywhere. There was it was it was very nasty. But what happened? What I found out later had happened. When he drove by the base operations center, the smoke got ingested by the base operations ventilation system and set off all the smoke detectors. But when that happens, this is an active submarine hunting base. When that happens, they have to evacuate the building. So to evacuate the building, they have to scram all the top secret information and dump it all. So. So all of this gets scrapped, and of course, the telex machines across, you got to think this is the 90s, the telex machines across the country are bouncing off the table. So you got MAG HQ, Maritime Air Group HQ in Halifax, and you've got Air Command in Winnipeg, and you have NDHQ in Ottawa, Prime and then you have NORAD, NORAD in, in both the, 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 the Mount Mountain and in uh, North Bay, and the telex machines are bouncing off the wall saying that base operations in Greenwood's burning down. At the same time, somebody called in a grass fire because of the smoke coming from this cold smoke on the runway. And the MPs showed up and called EOD. So now the telex machines are bouncing off the table. There's a bomb threat on the runway. (laughs) Oh my gosh. It was a very bad week. (laughs) And you're just sitting there, what have I done? Like, this is not what I planned. How many toilets did you end up cleaning with a toothbrush after this? Well, we actually got protected by the squadron because uh, the... 
They pulled the old. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever I seen. I am Spartacus. Movie. Yeah, I am Spartacus. Yeah. <laughs> they literally pulled it. So we admitted to it right off. Like we're not going to hide mm-hmm. because we're screwed, right? <laughs> It's better to just admit to just, it just and get that over with. Go to jail because you're better off. And <laughs> what happened was after all the dust started to settle, the uh, our 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 supervisors went straight to the commanding officer and said, "Well, we knew what was going on and we didn't stop it, so you have to charge us." And it went right up the chain. Oh, Everybody so up the good. chain went went into the CEO's office and said, "Well, I have to be charged too because I was looking out my <laughs> office window and I was laughing at it. I didn't stop it." <laughs> And yeah, so we basically got protected by the rest of the squadron. Oh, so it's awesome. yeah, kind of like you had to do something to everyone never, or no one. And you never did something that stupid again. Actually, I did. <laughs> I, I was going to say, really? I'm like, that's... Yeah. Well, I almost caused an anthrax scare. Uh, okay, okay, okay. We're not, we're not getting into this now. Oh, oh by the way. <laughs> so April Fool's, my favorite day of the year. <laughs> so I'm going to stay away from you to, um, tomorrow. tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, except he knows where we live. I won't be there. I'll be at work. <laughs> Oh, by the way, uh, I'll be at work too. <laughs> uh, I guess from last week, Robert Stanley uh, sent us a message, uh, a little audio message. He says uh, what he thought about the episode we did with him. He said, uh, "It was without a doubt the worst episode ever." <laughs> Rest assured that I was on the internet within minutes, registering my disgust throughout the world. <laughs> no, no, that's not true. Robert actually loved us, and he actually invited us back on his show. So the crew will what be appearing nice on guy. his show. The right I wish I'd been on that show. You missed out, man. I missed it. Really you get fun. another shot at it. Yeah, exactly. You get that was, shot. That, that's really something. Yeah. Congrats. Okay. <laughs> so now it's all time for our favorite segment we always like to call. Another brilliant moment brought to you by religion. <laughs> Happy now? Wasn't in big enough space. Oh, well, excuse <laughs> me, Miss Perfect. <laughs> okay. Did you guys hear about a, uh, a, te- a Toronto-based ice cream chain called Sweet Jesus? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. This is awesome. They're facing calls for a boycott from Christians who say the name is blasphemous and oh. mocks their religion. The chain, founded in 2015 by Andrew Richmond and uh, Amina Todai, has 20 locations, mainly clustered around the greater Toronto area. It's a Canadian yep. company. It's known for a decade of frozen dessert, has recently expanded to the U.S. and plans more locations south of the border, which wow. has raised the ire of Christians. <laughs> Quote, Choosing the name of our Lord as a brand of soft-serve ice cream is totally offensive and revolting. That's <laughs> ridiculous. Does anybody know how to do a GoFundMe page? Because I'd love to help these guys out. <laughs> They probably this, already have This one. is great publicity for them. Oh, it's totally. awesome. Totally. Because the thing is, nobody... Had, I want to Nobody taste had heard of it. I, I want to Sweet Jesus. I want, I want one of those. I yeah. totally want one of those. Bring us some backs. Are you going anywhere I'm, near? Oh, hey. I can hit the place and tell them. Yeah, hey, it's going to be atheist, melted by the time you come back here. <laughs> yeah. Dry, pack some and dry ice. Dry ice around it, it and bring it back. Yeah. Well, at least have some for us. Yeah. Um, this is anything but a mere mistake, they said. The petition signed by almost 10,000 people reads both in their promotional materials Material and menu selection, it is plain to see that Richmond, uh, Richmond and Todai have every intention of mocking Christ and Christianity, if anything, would qualify as hate speech. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, wow. I don't know. I, I kind of like the idea of that. I want to, I, I totally want some of that. I, yeah, I, I've got to hit a couple of those places. Mm-hmm. The greater it's, Toronto area. It's definitely so, yeah. a genius... Like, it, it only helps this company, mm-hmm. like, with their ice cream. It only helps them. Like, yeah, they have some stickers that we can put on our I'll, I'll see what yeah, they've bring, got for paraphernalia. Yeah, bring some, ba- bring some stuff back. I don't think having an ice cream cone in the shape of a cross or something like that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be too great. All right. Here's another story. Which much media focus on the alleged affair between President Donald Trump and the adult uh, Stormy Daniels, yeah. the, the, uh, the porn actress there. Evangelicals decide to crank the delusion to 11 and are again <laughs> comparing Donald Trump to the biblical King David. Uh, what? Yeah. Well, if he didn't exist, it would be good. But... <laughs> okay, so what do we know about David? He uh, didn't exist? <laughs> yeah, that too. Uh, <laughs> according to 2 Samuel 11 and 12, it tells the story of David and Bathsheba, whose hub- husband is Uri- uh, Uriah. Well, Uriah is off at war, and David noticed Bathsheba while she's bathing. And he has, brought her, uh, he, he has her brought to his quarters. After sleeping with her, she becomes pregnant, and King David attempts to have Uriah and also sleep with her to hide the affair. Right? But Uriah, he, he won't take time off in the battle and doesn't sleep with his wife. So King David has uh, puts Uriah in the front lines where he's sure to die. 
After Uriah is gone, King David takes Bathsheba as one of his wives, and the son is born. Christian values right there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Christian values. So, basically, the, the evangelicals are saying, well, you know, David wasn't perfect. Donald Trump isn't perfect. But he's chosen by God because God has a tendency to choose people that have a tendency to cheat on their wives. I think Kim, Kim, Kim Jong-un is chosen by God. I know he is a God. Apparently. You know, it's ama- not amazing, but they'll contort and distort everything in in the Bible in order to protect this man. I mean, it just it, Christianity is just a perverse form, you know, of of, of what um, fantasy. I, I I can't I, I can't think of the word, but the fact that Trump doesn't even acknowledge it. He doesn't apologize for it. He bragged about mm-hmm. you know his prowess with women before the election, and now. You know the the Christians are are a hundred percent on his side. If it had been a Democrat oh, under yeah. the same circumstances, I mean, there's this 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 shield you know around Trump that there's it, a double standard. A double standard that they just they, they can't penetrate. No, yeah, absolutely, I can't. It's just it's just ridiculous. And, and evangelicals are so far beyond. What the base of their religion is supposed to be? I mean, there's no be. morality. No, there's no, they're beyond that. No it's, morality. It, today, it, to, yeah, you can't they even call it up up as they just call them, you know, Republicans <laughs> because that's what it is. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see how how it all turns out. I think. I think. Well, I was going to say, I think this may be, you know, the the, uh, the scandal that brings him down. But well, there are about four it, going. It, yeah, it, it's really interesting because um, if you. If you really want an amazing breakdown of like the Stormy Daniel fiasco, mm-hmm. um, uh, uh, opening arguments we've had uh, uh, Andrew on uh, before a few yep. months ago, yep. and their podcast covers it. It's so amazing because like they break down like the legal genius of Stormy Daniels in how. Hold on a second. Here. You're 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 using this show air, and air yes. to publicize for another podcast. Yes. Yes, no, but, shameless. But, well, but the thing is, it's the, this whole scandal is so important to like what might actually cause Donald Trump to step down from a presidency. Yeah, because there's so many things that they've been doing that are just like ridiculous and like, oh, that's actually a crime. Oh wow, and he just admitted to it. Oh wow. Well, well yeah, I, I agree, but you know what? Ever since Donald Trump moved into the White House, we've been saying, "Oh well, this is the one yeah. that's going to bring him down," and it hasn't. Happened Nothing's yet. brought him down. Exactly. He's Teflon. He's, yeah. he's Teflon made from made. Teflon. That's because the Republicans refuse to take the high ground yeah. and do what he needs to do to. to get, well, I would put them out of power. But okay. the midterms are coming, children. You know. <laughs> Uh, speaking, of, speaking of people in orange means, a uh, Christian church leader tried to prove that the Lord would keep him safe, and he stepped towards and forward. Uh, uh, sorry, would step forward, and re- the Lord would step forward and come to his rescue and save him. Recently, when he went up against a lion, um, the when? lion won, didn't it? <laughs> well, things did not go as planned, Ooh. as the church leader had his buttocks and arm mauled by a lion. <laughs> as he so, went, either, wow, the, so either the lion is stronger than God. <clears throat> Or there's no God, or or the third option is he's a sinner and uh, God he got what he deserved. Him. Well, the the guy the guy's name I is. I mean, uh, there's three options. The guy is uh, the Zion Christian Church prophet Alec Nidwin was viciously attacked by the lion during a safari trip. The man wanted to prove the church members uh, with him that God would save him. So the man, he went into a, some kind of trance. He began to speak in many different languages and then started to run towards the pride of lions that were eating an impala. Wait, he ran He toward ran towards the lions. A group of lions. That Wait, were so eating an impala. It's not even just like one lone lion. No, no, no. He, he ran pride them. A group. So the man has started approaching the pack very quickly, and of course, they wanted to protect their kill. Oh, uh, yeah. Of course they did, yeah. And then they saw him as prey as well. So, hey, dessert's coming our way. <laughs> <laughs> so as the man wow. charged up to them, then the pride grouped up uh, on him and attacked. The lions chased him before one of them actually bit down on his ass. <laughs> And then promptly spit him out, because, ew. <laughs> Nidwan said that he did not have any idea about what came over him. <laughs> really? Your own stupidity came over you, buddy. Wow. And, said that human, and he, he, he said that humans were given dominion all over the Earth's creature. 
Well, so much for your freaking dominion, right? Uh, that's right. I mean, you're, how do you're, we, you're either have... The lion didn't get the memo. That, well, that's how, right. how do we reward the lion? Uh, you may think you're, you may <laughs> it gets think a, free you're a religious meal. prophet, but in reality, you're some lion's dessert. Hey, wait a minute. Did, wasn't this, wasn't this some clear. kind of rumor that Romans were, were giving Christians to the lions? Yeah. Was there a Roman standing in the background? Yeah. <laughs> I just feel sorry for that, like, the person, like, conducting that saf- safari, having their the person they're trying to, like, look at the lions, but stay in the car. <laughs> just runs. I'm so, like, seriously? Seriously? So, so when he went, uh, realized that the Lord was not going to help him out, <laughs> he began to try to run back towards the car. However, it wasn't long before one of the lions caught up with him, of course, and really? bit him in the ass. <laughs> You think the lion that's went back amazing. after that? Yeah, that's a horrible thing. That's taste. amazing oh. that he survived. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, it's really. I mean, if I was his tour guide, I would have just went. Excuse my language, but I would have fuck it. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> on his own. It was said that he only managed to get away thanks to a game range firing shots towards a lion to make them run away. Mm -hmm. So So does that that in any way prove that he was right, that God saved him? No. Yeah, God God was behind the gun. Oh, okay. (laughs) It's like, remember the old joke that said, you know, uh, if a lion's going to eat me, make sure it's a Christian lion, and the lion (laughs) holds his paws and says, thank you, Lord, for the meal I'm about to receive. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, it's just amazing because the, the guys are Christians. So any excuse will do. There is no God won't come up in the in the discussion. Yeah. But okay, so he got punished for being a sinner. One, yeah. two, God saved him through the act of the uh, tour guide or the the guide. The guys who shot right? the, the guys who shot at the lions. Uh, three, God saved him because he's I don't still know alive. whatever he's still alive. Right? It, it, there's going to be like multiple. It was a stories. lesson. It was a lesson yeah, from God. It was a yeah. lesson from God. Um, and and if he hadn't been such a sinner, it wouldn't have happened. Yeah, so, God so I mean, his faith wasn't strong enough, obviously. Yeah, exactly. Oh my God! I <laughs> think the lesson can be here: don't run full tilt at a pride of lions. While the they're eating, could be, you know, think you the think lesson could be we should have hobbled him so he couldn't run away. <laughs> you you think that wouldn't be a lesson you need to learn? <laughs> you <Yeah>. think? <laughs> oh, anyway, religion has a Why way of breaking Darwin's, down common sense. You know, that could have been a perfect Darwin. Darwin uh, Award. Darwin Award. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right, it, guys. It still might be. <laughs> <laughs> the year is young. Good point. <laughs> Thank you so much for your thoughts on this. So uh, let's go to commercial break, and then when we come back, we'll be with Ethan Seal and science. talk about the science of Star Trek and technology. <laughs> <laughs> Stay with us. In a world torn apart by a lack of reason. Or at least yes, up here, yes, up here, yes, up here. And I think it should be religion treated with ridicule and hatred and contempt. And I claim that right. In the morning. Hi everybody, this is Robert Stanley from the Right to Reason podcast. And if you subscribe now, you'll get free. Learn more about the broadcast at the right to reason.com. Do you know where Saskatchewan is? Probably not. It's in Canada. If you do, you might know a city named Regina. In Regina, there's a studio. And in that studio, there are, at least once a month, a bunch of skeptical atheist geeks and goofballs who get together to do a podcast. We are the Brainstorm Crew, and we're trying to help spread a bit of reason and critical thinking while still having fun. Never taking things too seriously, but still not accepting everything we're told, we go through different topics, exploring them in depth, and often disagreeing. We try to stick to provable facts, and we never trust a myth. That's why we say we're woo-free since 2000. 2013. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, or Spreaker under Brainstorm. Or check out our website, brainstormblog.net. I can't promise you'll always agree with us, but I can promise you'll have fun listening to us. It was this point of mystery, and in gets invoked God. This, over time, has been described by philosophers as the God of the gaps. If that's where you're going to put your God in this world, then God is an ever-receding pocket of scientific ignorance. When you're gone for days, on your own, take a look at 
Okay, so joining us online, guys, is Ethan Siegel. He is an author, and he also studied theoretical astrophysics. Astrophysics? Ah! Astrophysics. Theoretical astrophysics. You had it right We're going to put all of these outtakes in the start of the totally. podcast. Absolutely. And he's a snappy dresser and a snazzy dancer. <laughs> Ethan, thank you for joining us at Left of the Valley. <laughs> all right. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, Kevin and everybody. You're saying that now, but in five minutes, you might change your tone. <laughs> Hey, science is amazing. Science well, he's, is he's already amazing. seen how we usually end up going things, going somewhere. <laughs> exactly, he's had a taste of us already. Uh, Ethan, uh, you, it's the first time on your show, on our show. If you'd be so kind, maybe you'd be uh, you'd give us a quick bio of who you are for our audience. Sure. Uh, so my name's Ethan Siegel. I'm a theoretical astrophysicist. I got my PhD from University of Florida a whopping 12 years ago already. <laughs> uh, and since then, I've been a researcher, a uh, scientist, a professor. And uh, now I mostly write and communicate science full time. And you can catch my blog starts with a bang over at Forbes. Uh, there's probably a new story six days a week. And I've got a couple of books out. Uh, Beyond the Galaxy, How Humanity Ooh. Looked Beyond the Milky Way and Discovered the Entire Universe, and Treknology, The Science of Star Trek, From Tricorders to Warp Drive. Fantastic, and we are going to talk about that today, and we have to I have to mention that he sports one of the best beers I have ever seen. Oh, I gotta ever. see this, I gotta see this. No, you gotta see this, he's got, yeah, he's got a fantastic make sure, beer. Make sure you get a load of this, I've, uh, oh, I've got my beard nice. here. Uh, I've got a mustache here. I'll give you a close-up oh, look. Very he, nice. is, he is yeah. beyond yeah, man. You, get, like you get people hey. who make fish faces. I bet you've never seen a grown man make a catfish face before. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to work great, especially our medium is audio. The best I do is just Santa Claus. <laughs> okay. Me, I, I think I have years, the best I'll beard be the here, Santa guys. Claus. 20 years in a wig. <laughs> awesome. I don't need the wig. I just I just color all my hair. I sit for in the chair for <laughs> And a half. This is way off topic already. So, <laughs> hey, it's technology. So we're talking about Star Trek. Uh, you guys went way left of the valley. Way, way left. <laughs> we, 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 we're you actually back mind. in the valley at this point. Ethan, you have yet to see left. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about Star Trek today, and you know when people think about Star Trek, uh, of course we're talking about the show that had probably a huge influence on at least one generation, uh, but. Well, I'm sure uh, I, there was a, a documentary that came out a few years ago that, that talked about uh, how William Shatner changed the world. I'm sure you're familiar with that uh, documentary. I mean, anything that has William Shatner in the title is definitely going to give you an excellent Bill Shatner perspective <laughs> on how Bill Shatner is the greatest human being yep. in human history. <laughs> I think he'd like he that. And did he tell you about Star Trek V, by the way? Oh, yes. Which he <laughs> directed and wrote. Yes, which is probably the worst one of them all, too. <laughs> but um, we're talking about Trek and how how much of an influence it had today on our people, our generation, our technology. And you wrote an entire book about that. So please, if you'd be so kind, enlighten us on what you, how do you feel Star Trek had this kind of profound influence on us? You know, for me, Star Trek was really this fusion of two fantastic things. On the one hand, it was this nexus of science and technology and how it's developing and how it influences our lives and how it empowers us to to be more powerful creatures, to be more impactful, to make a difference in the world. But Star Trek also brought with that for good or for evil. Star Trek really brought with us this this concept that technology by itself is only a neutral thing, but it's how we use it. It's how we apply it to our world. Do we use this for our own personal gain? Do we use this to, to enrich ourselves? Or do we use it for the betterment of all of humanity? Do we use it to overcome our basic, our, our most base impulses? And do we instead use it to alleviate the greatest problems facing the world? Things like hunger, inequality, racism, uh, bigotry, um, you know, food scarcity, water scarcity, all of these problems, these are problems that can be addressed. And when Star Trek brought them up, it brought them up in a way that we could address them because it was through this fictional lens. But at the same time, it envisioned this near utopian future where, yes, humanity still had problems. And, you know, the Federation, the civilization still had problems, conflicts, wars, um, you know, different parties with different stakes and different interests. But it also said, you know what, um, 
we need to look at what's right and what's wrong, who gets affected, what are the different things at play, what are our principles, and and it embraced uh, an interesting type of philosophy that I don't think we get to see very often, or certainly hadn't seen very often at the time, uh, that I like to call moral particularism, where you mm. do have your principles, but you don't adhere to one guiding principle over everything all the time. Sometimes you need to violate that principle because something even more important is at stake. Um, And so, you know, they talk a lot about the prime directive on Mm -hmm. Starfleet and how this is the inviolable rule, and then every captain violates it all the time. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. When when people think about the science of Star Trek, they think about the technology, the tools, the the, the technology itself, but it's much more than just that. I mean, you have the, you can think about the science of the world they inhabit themselves, the science of the the kind of government they have, and the the kind of world they have, the, the culture how they project their culture and stuff like that. Uh, do you actually tackle that these kind of issues in your book as well? I, I talk both about the technological issues and also the ethical issues. Mm. So for me, every technology has it has its role in the Star Trek universe. Here's how the technology is introduced. Here's how it's applied. Here's how it's used. I'll also talk about, okay, here's the real world. Here's where we are in the year 2018. Okay, admittedly, I wrote the book last year, so <laughs> 2017. But uh, not that much has progressed. Um, so... Thankfully, it's all still up to date. What we say is, you know, here's what Star Trek said about it. Here's how Star Trek used it. Now, here's how here's where we are today. So in terms of something like uh, Geordi's visor from Star Trek The Next Generation, yes. where are we on restoring sight to the blind? What progress have we made towards that? On something like uh, the ship's computer from Star Trek, where you would talk to it and it would talk back and do its processing, we've made huge advances there, um, you know, with things like Siri and Cortana and Alexa, and, you know, we're, mostly this is outdated now, and you're like, shut up already, I'll just type it in. Um, <laughs> but so but there, are, there are a lot of incredible technologies that have come to fruition that are on their way or that 50 some odd years ago when Star Trek premiered we thought were pure fiction and now it looks like these may actually be real but I also make sure wherever it's applicable wherever it's important you have to bring up those ethical concerns too and this is true not just for the sci- for the technologies that Star Trek envisioned but also for the technologies we're developing and that we've developed that maybe weren't envisioned by Star Trek or that maybe are going to come down the line where we're going to have to ask, hey, what are we going to trade off here? What are we giving up if we embrace this technology? For instance, just talking about that same vision-related technology, we've gone beyond what Geordi's visor was. We have a technology where we can implant a chip in someone's visual cortex right mm-hmm. in their brain right. and wirelessly send information from either a camera that rests on their head. Monash University this decade developed what's called a hat pack. Mm-hmm. And they they can do that wirelessly, or you can hook it up to an external camera and have that send signals in. The thing is, when I worry about that, I think about, oh, wow, what about cybersecurity? Cybersecurity is one thing when it's your passwords that are getting hacked, when it's your identity and your private information. But what do you do now when it's potentially your own bodily senses your eyes, that yeah. are going to be hacked, that someone's going to feed you false information, that you see the road turns ahead to the left, but in actuality it turns to the right and you're driving in your car? That's like what, ultimate, what do we feel about, about that? that? That's ultimate trolling. Okay, so, so let's jump into what, what we think is possible and impossible. For example, if we talk about Star Trek, you got to th- think about the Starship, of course, and warp drive. Is this something that in the future we can actually seriously think that this might actually happen? Okay, so I will fess up right away. There are 28 technologies in the book. There are four of them that I will say are not possible unless there's more to the laws of physics, the laws of nature than we know right now. Mm -hmm. Warp drive is one of them. Warp drive is one of them. I'll also say, just right off the bat, uh, 
artificial gravity is one of them. Mm -hmm. Subspace communication is one of them, right? We don't know about subspace. We only have the regular kind. So, so we do have some technologies that will require something additional to exist if we want it to mm -hmm. be possible. Now, if you had asked me this question 25 years ago, I would have told you, yeah, warp drive, that's a pipe dream. Like we have the laws of relativity yes. and we know how space works and that's pretty much it. Like if there's a star 40 light years away you can go there pretty fast right you travel arbitrarily close to the speed of light and maybe because of length contraction you can make this 40 light year journey in like six months and then on the way back you know same thing you do your business for six months you come back another six months and you've traveled 80 light years in just one year sounds like a great deal until you get home and you realize under the laws of special relativity for you traveling close to the speed of light you've aged one year but everyone back home has aged 81 yeah. years i could see an and upside so, to that <laughs> and so you know you you go and see your grandson and your grandson is a generation older than you now and this That's is right. This is not maybe what you wanted to have happen. So um, in 1994, I believe, a theoretical physicist named Miguel Alcubierre found a solution in Einstein's general relativity where he said, you know what? That whole thing in special relativity where you have length contraction, that's important. But what you can do if you construct the right type of space time is you can say, hey, if my ship is traveling in this direction and I set up a warp bubble around it, what I can do is I can take the space in front of me and contract it. And the way I make up for this is that the space behind my bubble expands by an equal amount. So now I've got this new space time I've created. And as I travel through it, as the warp bubble moves through space and the ship moves through the bubble, I'm traveling through this compressed space. So I'm not actually going faster than light, but I've deformed space enough that I can travel this shortened distance and arrive at my destination. And then when I come back, I can do the same thing in the opposite direction. And you'll find, unlike in the special relativity case, that you and the people back home have aged by the same amount. That's so cool. What, what, so I, I, this I, is known as the Alcubierre space-time. Forgive, um, forgive my ignorance. it's physically possible. Forgive my ignorance but I, I kind of got the picture there that it was almost like surfing a wave. Am I, was I correct there as you were moving through space? No, I'm just using my hands. It's not like surfing a wave. Okay, okay. It's, <laughs> like, it's like being in a bubble and the bubble is moving through compressed and leaving rarefacted space behind it where rarefaction is the opposite of compression. Okay, I just, okay, okay. It's a big word. No, no, that totally works. <laughs> All right. Um, but the thing is, in order for that to exist, and just to be completely honest, you need some form of either negative mass or negative energy to make that work. That's the extra ingredient we need that we don't know if we have in this universe. But interestingly enough, there's an experiment going on at CERN called the Alpha Experiment, where we know what direction matter falls in a gravitational field. It falls down. On Earth, it falls down at 9.8 meters per second squared. What about antimatter? Guess what? We've never measured it. We expect antimatter is going to fall down in a gravitational field. But if it falls up instead, mm. all of a sudden, that means warp drive is possible. Wow. That would be awesome. That sort of <laughs> that blew my mind. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and that's perfect. chapter one. That's There's chapter one. in the book. Well. <laughs> and when people think about Star Trek, chapter two, they think about transporters, right? You beam me down, Scotty, or beam me up, Scotty. Now, I think, this, I think that, that actually that, is chapter that, two. That, I think you that, nailed it. Have you read this book? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid I have not read it yet, but Tran I will. Transporters open up such an interesting ethical question. Because, like, um, like, I don't know. I have actually never watched Star Trek. I'm okay. a horrible person okay. for that. The comments of uh, Christina are not necessarily <laughs> those of Lincoln. No, 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 tell I, me, tell me. I want to know, what's your ethical question? Because well, I have an ethical question about the transporters too, when, but I want to know yours first. When it de dematerializes you and transports your matter, is it transporting the actual matter or is it just refiguring atoms in your destination, like a whole new set of atoms? Yeah, is it so you or is it a clone Are you created with different, like technically different atoms 
Okay, so this is something that Star Trek fans argue about, because in (laughs) early editions of Star Trek, in the original series, they talk about the matter stream. They talk about taking you apart, particle by particle, beaming all those particles over, and then reassembling you out of the same material. Now, I would argue that this does not address your question. Because what you want to know is, is this still you? And what I'm going to tell you is, hey, are you the same person that you were seven years ago? Yeah. Well, and well, you're going to say, I, I, yeah, I, I am. I and I'm don't think say, I am. Hey, how many of those atoms that are in your body today were in your body seven years None. ago? And you're going to say, I don't know, zero? Yeah. And the answer is, yeah, it's zero. zero. So is it the atoms? This is this is what I call the you-ness problem. Mm-hmm. Like, what makes you, you? Yeah. Well, I actually don't believe in, like, a soul or anything. So for me, like, if, if there's a clone of me that has the exact same brain pattern, brave brain waves, and the same, like, imprint of experiences, like, I would consider that me. Well, any outside observer would consider that you. Yeah. But I'm going to I'm going to make a simpler analogy here. You know the difference between copy control X and paste control V yeah. or command if you're an Apple user and the difference between that and copy delete paste. If we do that first one, if we do cut and paste, then we're not changing you or the data. Yeah. We're just re-giving it a different address. So we're, you know, we, we just make a reference and we, we give it a different address. It's still you. But if we copy you and delete you and paste that information somewhere else, that's not you anymore. That is a copy of you with your memories and your same mind and all of that, but it won't be you. So that's a big worry that I have. Every time on Star Trek, when they send someone through a transporter, are you murdering someone and creating (laughs) a whole new life where to an external person, it appears, oh, no, like we just moved Ethan from point A to point B and everything's fine. And point B, Ethan is like, yeah, I'm fine. I I got all my memories. Everything's good. It just point A, Ethan is just dead now. (laughs) This shows up in a couple of episodes of Star Trek in the original series. There's a transporter accident and they make a copy of Captain Kirk. In the next generation, this happens to Will Riker. Yes. And Thomas Riker gets created. And it's an accident where Will gets transported out off of a dangerous situation on the planet's surface and Tom Riker because it's a copy Tom Riker is still there and he's Mm -hmm. marooned there for years and when they come back they discover that they are very very different people Wow. Yeah. Well, for, so for... this is this is absolutely an ethical question mm-hmm. with the transporter and I bring it up in the book but just like you and I right now don't really have an answer yeah, totally. to what is being transported. Is it still you? This is definitely something where I'm going to agree with Captain Archer from the prequel series Enterprise where he said he wouldn't put his dog through that thing. I'm all for the transporter for inanimate objects. Yeah, as I but recall, McCoy had a real problem with things, that, too. I like my dog. Wow, you, you guys really know your track. <laughs> I thought I knew well, my track, but you guys the, really know it. For, for me, as I've never seen Star Trek. I've only seen, like, the two new, or three new movies. But um, I grew up watching, like, Stargate and um, no, uh, no. other, like, science fiction, like, TV shows. And, like, Doctor Did Who. Did you send my regards to King Tut? No. <laughs> <laughs> but a, a question I have, if we let's say for example we live in a world where transporters become possible, the amount of information to take a person apart atom by atom is astounding, wouldn't it be? Just like incredible? Yeah, it would. But that is not necessarily a deal breaker because if there's one thing that the phenomenon of quantum teleportation is good for it is the entanglement and transfer and linking of information how much would you need if you had a quantum computer that could entangle all the information in your body it would only need the same number of particles that's in your body to do it so if i could say hey for every particle in my body i'm going to entangle it with another quantum particle 
right? Now I've got something that's entangled. If this one is like this, then this one is like this because I know how entanglement works. So if I take all those particles that are entangled with me and I send them off somewhere and then I use them to reconstitute me, it's going to reconstitute me in exactly the same quantum state because with these particles, once you measure their quantum state and you see it's like this, you know my quantum state is the other value. So that information is the easy thing. Quantum teleportation is the real life phenomenon that we know can teleport all of that information without a problem. The big problem is, you know, right now we don't know how to reconstruct from information an actual biological organism and have it be alive. Um, I see another problem. Yeah, that's a problem. What you, what's your what's what, the, what do you, you see? What do you do with the original copy? Because anything you do with the original copy is quantum entangled with the copy. So if you destroy the original, you destroy the copy. Well, that is not necessarily true because okay, good. <laughs> the reason they're entangled is because you say, okay, we have the same quantum state. But just because you mess with this one that's not the same as measuring it, right? You break entanglement when you measure a quantum state. You don't break entanglement when you force something into a different quantum state. Like that, that doesn't affect the quantum state over here. A measurement is different than like severing ties. Hmm. So if I have an indeterminate quantum thing over here, right? Um, it, this this shows up in in normal experiments too. Like okay. you don't have to do anything fancy. Like if I take a photon, two photons, I've got them entangled. One of them is going to be spin up. One of them is going to be spin down because I know what the sum of their spins have to be. So I say, okay, I've got these two indeterminate entangled things and I bring them super far apart. Now I want to know over here at my destination, uh, what happened to the original? So I can say, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this one, the destination particle, and I'm going to measure it. And I measure it to be down. That tells me the original one was up. Yes. That's a consequence of entanglement. Then you have the brilliant idea of, aha, what if I want to send information? What if I want to tell this guy over at the original source, hey, you go up. So I say, hey, over here, destination particle, I'm going to force you to be down. Is this source particle going to be forced to be up or is it indeterminate down up because I broke the entanglement by forcing this guy to be down? So if I destroy you, the original, that does not force the quantum state of the other stuff to into a specific state. What it does is it says, nope, all of that is no good. You force this into a state. This is still indeterminate. Okay. So that means, if I'm following correctly here, and forgive my ignorance of all this because <laughs> you guys are way Quantum mechanics is weird. <laughs> So th does Spooky. that mean that if, for example, you would beam Scott somewhere, during the transport process, because where, where the, the particles are entangled, you could also store a copy of him if you wanted to as a backup? Let's yeah. see, your destination fact, fail for some reason. You you sound like someone who hasn't watched enough Star Trek because this happens. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> this happens in Star Trek The Next Generation. They have an episode called Relics where Scotty. they find, oh, there's something being stored in the pattern buffer of one of these transporters. And who is it? It's James Doohan. It's mm. Scotty from the original Star Trek. Shows up in The Next Generation. Oh, that's so that cool. Was, that was He's such an awesome episode. Curious. Because he wakes up in this world and he meets Lieutenant Commander Data, an android, and he goes to the bar and they feed him synthahol <laughs> instead of alcohol. <laughs> and he he gets to do a fabulous spit take. It'll, <laughs> what is this crap? <laughs> he goes to Captain Picard and he's like, I'm all out of place in this world with synthetic scotch and synthetic commanders. And, you know, <laughs> Captain Picard does the one thing you can do to get Scotty in your good graces. And he gives him some real alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Moving on from transporters. What about the weaponry? Because God knows it's not a human world unless there's weapons. Something like phasers. You know, the, the classic laser beam phaser thing. 
Phasers are a fantastic idea. I absolutely love, you know, people are like, oh, yeah, we have tasers. That's like a phaser. No, it's not like a phaser. Like, you don't have to, like, cattle prod someone. Like, that's what a taser <laughs> is. It's a it's a wire. It's a wired cattle prod. I don't um, think you should uh, but, complain until you try it. <laughs> I hope. I hope I never. We're going to do this, Kevin. You give me the taser and I'll fire. No, no, I didn't you. say you had to be on the receiving end of it. I didn't say that. <laughs> Yeah, I, the, the you know, I just some people completely. are totally into that, and if you're into that, like, go for it, uh, oh boy. but uh, I do not consent to any taserings, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what I would like to say about that is um, the military, in, about 10 years ago, they announced the development of a tank-mounted weapon which works just like a phaser is designed to. What it is, is it's a two-phased electromagnetic pulse. The first pulse is ultraviolet radiation, which is hot enough, high enough energy that it can knock electrons off of atoms. So wherever this pulse hits you, it creates a little bit of ionized plasma. It's not enough to burn you or hurt you. It just makes a plasma. The second pulse is a high energy infrared or microwave pulse. This is something you would normally feel as just a little bit of heat. But what it does when it hits the plasma is all of that plasma just rapidly absorbs that energy. And when you have a plasma that rapidly absorbs energy, it heats up. And when you heat up, you expand. Oh. And if you expand fast enough, you explode. Ooh. And so this exploding plasma makes a concussive blast that can knock a target off of their feet from a distance of two kilometers away, oh, right? Because wow. you're Canadian, two kilometers away. <laughs> And it's non-lethal. So it can knock you off your feet. It can possibly knock you unconscious. And you don't have any risk of murdering someone. And that's so what that is what it's you, you guys From definitely need that. Weapon. Yes. <laughs> can you imagine what this would mean for law enforcement to be able to disable a target of interest from such a tremendous distance without having to use lethal force? How? I don't know. It might not stunned. be that difference in Canada where your police are mounted and in big bright red suits <laughs> with horses. batons. <laughs> but in the USA, this would really address mm -hmm. a large number of social how, problems that how, we have How um, uh, accurate is the blast? Like, Is it like over a large range or can it be like very um, directed? Yeah. It's it's about as accurate as a very well collimated laser beam. Nice. So, wow. um, you know, like I said, the big problem is it's tank mounted. Um, and so it's pretty hard to be like, oh, yeah, like I'll just pull out mm -hmm. my taser. So they just need to work on so, refining the technology I, to make it smaller, probably. They would need to refine it. They need to make it smaller. They need mm -hmm. to scale it down. And they'd also need to calibrate it to be at the proper power setting because totally. you don't want to create it. a concussive blast yeah. that will blow a building over. You want to yeah. create a concussive <laughs> blast of the right magnitude to disable and not harm a human target. Mm -hmm. I take it they used a tank due to the size of the vehicle and the amount of power available? You know, it's really interesting when you start to research military applications, how much information you cannot find. <laughs> yeah. I, I'll just, I'll just has, as a technical person myself, I'll hazard a guess that the tank <laughs> probably could be stripped down of armor to make space for equipment. And the engines on the tank produce enough horsepower that you would be able to mount some fairly sized generators. <laughs> I, I think that's a reasonable guess, but... Uh, Apparently, when people are on a need-to-know basis, I'm not someone who needs to know. <laughs> no. It's None for science, goddammit. <laughs> yeah, like, I, we just want to know for science. Well, they yeah. probably don't want this falling into the wrong hands. Can you imagine some, some great crackpot going around with a five-ton truck and... Well, the, one of these antennas mounted on top, just having fun. They should, yeah, they should that, try that, we don't need Alex Jones getting hold of this. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think yeah, there's a, there's a... <laughs> I, I tell you, there are some people in some power that I'm a lot oh. more worried about than Alex Jones. Oh, totally. But that's not what my book is about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, but there's probably a nice target somewhere in some office so, on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue somewhere. I oh think. my gosh! So you talk, nice you talk about phasers. <laughs> what about photon torpedoes? 
Good question. I love photon torpedoes. All right. So the way photon torpedoes work are brilliant, right? You have this big, you know, if you saw Star Trek 2 and 3, you know, you have this big coffin-sized casing. Mm-hmm. Um, and split down the middle, half of it is matter. Half of it is antimatter. And so what you do is you launch this half matter, half antimatter torpedo at your target, and when you want it to detonate, you just take out the barrier separating them. You get matter antimatter annihilation, which is the most energy efficient weapon we have ever imagined. And a hundred percent of your mass, the matter and the antimatter, gets annihilated and converted into energy via Einstein's E equals M C squared. Wow. That is it, is, it is perfect. So how close are we to doing this? Well, the matter side is pretty easy. <laughs> yeah, I was but about the to say. antimatter side, we have made tremendous progress on in the last few years. Oh, yeah. We have we know how to create antimatter right you take particles you smash them in high energies into other particles and sometimes you can produce new matter antimatter pairs out of that pure energy equals mc squared works both ways you have enough energy you can make mass Mm. out of matter and antimatter so you can store this antimatter you can make antiprotons you can make antielectrons and they can slow them down now and bind them together into neutral anti-hydrogen wow. atoms wow we used to make antimatter and say well how long does it live for and the answer is tiny tiny fractions of a second <laughs> well as of today They've created these neutral anti-atoms, stored them in magnetic and electric fields for, I think, up to about 20 minutes at a time. And, yeah, maybe there's only, like, three anti-atoms in there. But how fantastic is that? This is proof of concept. We can create Mm -hmm. and store neutral antimatter. Now, if you can take enough of these anti-hydrogen atoms... That's all it's going to take because if you compress it to high enough pressures, it starts acting. Hydrogen starts acting as a metal. So you can create this metallic hydrogen structure, fill your photon torpedo with it, put an equal amount of matter in the other side, launch it and off you go. This is a problem that is not a fundamental physics problem. This is only a technical problem. This is is an engineering problem. This is plausible today. How much energy are we talking about with one neutral hydrogen atom and one neutral anti-hydrogen atom? Uh, well, other. one atom, right? Atoms are extremely light. An atom is 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Right. So, you know, E equals MC squared, mm-hmm. right? So E is going to equal M, which, you know, if you have two of these, this is going to be, because of decimals, this is like three times 10 to the minus 27 yeah. kilograms. But C squared is an enormous number. Right, the speed yeah, of light is three hundred thousand yeah. kilometers per second. So, if you do this math, you get what's E for matter antimatter annihilation. It's about uh, it's about thirty nanojoules of energy, and that might not sound like a lot, but if you take like a I don't know, I'm gonna say a. a um, apples worth a small apples worth of matter and antimatter and annihilated that uh that would be as large as any atomic bomb explosion we had in human history that's a lot of talking a coffin full of matter and antimatter that's a big you're talking about something that is really um you know, to go into a different sci-fi world, you're talking about something where if you had maybe a thousand, ten thousand photon torpedoes, you're talking Death Star power. You're talking wow. something that could blow up a whole planet. Yeah. Wow. I was kind of wondering there because you were saying that the coffin, the, the, the torpedo was divided in two. So you have matter on one side and antimatter on the other side. But wouldn't the coffin itself just be the matter? I mean, if, if the, 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 capsule... well, the coffin casing, we assume, is made of matter. Yeah. But you'd also assume that the way you've got it built is you've got a coffin casing, you've got matter and antimatter in equal amounts. So if you wanted to have the matter be on the outside and the antimatter be on the inside, that'd be okay with me. 
Um, you know, Star Trek, it's important to remember the reason we call it science fiction yeah. <laughs> is because they're full of these ideas. But if they knew exactly how all of these things were going to work, we wouldn't need scientists. We would just need sci-fi writers <laughs> and then we would yeah. go and build it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it will happen anyway. Ethan, do you, do you feel somebody like James Ronberry? I mean, what, what, I, I like to think of the man of... He's a bit more than an author. He's almost a visionary. The same way Joel Verne's was an author at some point, and you know when submarines came to exist and stuff like that, people thought thought of him as almost a prophet. You think Gene Roddenberry feels and falls in the same category? I mean, I think Gene Roddenberry, his vision, his combined vision for what the future would bring us both in terms of his altruistic view of what humanity can be and achieve and also his technological view of what we can accomplish as a species, it has been absolutely visionary. You know, when you talk about the pads from Star Trek mm, The Next Generation yes. and you see tablet computers and the iPad in particular, that was directly inspired by Star Trek. If you remember those first Motorola flip, flip phones, phones, the communicators. Um, communicators, that was directly inspired by Star Trek, the original series. If you look at things like tricorders, like these handheld medical scanning devices, they, built them. they just had the Qualcomm Tricorder X Prize awarded last year because a team, I love this, at Final Frontier Labs oh my gosh. <laughs> came out with a five pound device capable of remotely sensing and measuring 12 different bodily functions that could detect everything from your temperature to whether you had disease to what your respiration rate was to your pulse rate to like it did it could measure all of these things it could detect disease illness abnormalities in a five pound remote device that's incredible wow Ethan, you know, when you look at the world of the, the greater world of Star Trek, it's one civilization meaning the next civilization, you know, whether it's uh, Vulcans or Romulans or something like that. But they're on, 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 as a civilization, they're almost on the same level, right? And in the vastness of our universe, how likely is that to bump into, in your opinion, to bump into civilizations that are at the same level we are? You know, I think that's really interesting because if you look at human history, right? We were in the agricultural age for like 10, 15,000 years. We were in the steam age for a few hundred years. The 20th century saw us go through from the industrial age to the atomic age, to the space age, to the information age. Mm -hmm. The 21st century, I have a feeling we're going to see huge advances in nanotechnology, <laughs> in quantum computers. Um, so I think there's still more advances to be done. But with how rapidly we've been going, I think by time we get to the year, you know, 2300 or so, when Star Trek and Star Trek The Next Generation is supposedly happening – I think what we viewed as the future, that's something that most of those technologies were likely to see come about this century. Mm -hmm. And what the future is going to hold will seem an entire civilization advance over what we know it to be today. So I think where we are right now and what our vision of futuristic is, it's a very narrow window in a species history. So I think either you become this spacefaring technological civilization that reaches the limits of what technology can actually do. And that's something that either is going to happen relatively soon or we're going to go back to the dark ages. We're going to extinct ourselves. We're going to wipe ourselves out. So I think there is this technological infancy that we're living in right now that's so crucial to make it through these pitfalls, to make it through these difficult times, to, to truly value what we can accomplish if we all band together for the benefit of humanity and make that happen. Fantastic. What a great way, a positive way to finish this. Ethan, thank you so much for joining us today. But the mic is all yours, my friend. Be shameless. Go ahead. Plug yourself. Plug your book. If people want to reach you and f get your book, where can they find it? Make sure to go and find my book wherever books are sold. If you can't find them anywhere at your local bookstore, yell at them and then go to Amazon. <laughs> the book is called Technology. The Science of Star Trek from Tricorders to Warp Drive. Um, I had a great time writing it. My previous book is Beyond the Galaxy. I'll have a new book coming out next year. 
if all goes well. I'm writing it right now. Uh, and catch me over on Forbes. I blog it starts with a bang, and uh, I hope to see you there. That means you got to come back when you release your next book. You got to come back on the show and talk talk, talk to us about it. Done deal. <laughs> Ethan, before I let you go, I got to have you say, hi, I'm Ethan Siegel, and I took a left of the valley. Hi, I'm Ethan Siegel, and I took a left at the valley. And that was Mr. Ethan Siegel. Yay. What a fantastic guy. I love yeah. this guy. He's yeah. young. He's got lots Very of energy. Awesome. He's brilliant. Yep. And uh, goodness gracious, he's written many books, and I look forward to bringing him back on the show some other times. By the way, right now he's actually, uh, I'll try to find the link and put that in the notes of the show. He's trying to uh, organize a, uh, a trip to uh, Iceland. To see the Northern Lights. I want to go. And he's going to be your tour guide. I want to oh. go. And he's going to explain the science behind all that. So uh, look it's that up. It's good Iceland, guys. <laughs> when, when is the tour scheduled? I, I believe it's in January of ne- uh, next year. Oh, I'm not so sure. I don't people have, the have time. Yeah, they have time to do it. But, you know. Uh, Did they go to his website to. Yeah, you go, to, you go to his website. Just look at Ethan Siegel or a trip to, the, to, to Iceland, something like that. He's. He's, wow. he's, he's doing a, a, a group tour. Iceland that sounds is like one of the be best on, countries. On everybody's bucket list. So? What a, yeah, what oh, a yeah. That would Iceland, be. hands down, top five. Yeah. Right on. You know, you know it's kind of funny. Uh, we were talking about Star Trek. You know, I might as well ask this quickly before we, uh, we close the show. Uh, anybody have a favorite Star Trek episode? You want to quickly talk about? I, I don't I haven't really watched Star Trek. No, <laughs> okay. no I, I don't Star have Trek a favorite. Episode. There were too many, and I've forgotten most of them. But the only one that stands out because it was so silly was the Tribbles. The Tribbles. They the were the trouble so with Tribbles. The Tribbles. You know, yeah. the funny thing is, is the uh, I, I I I wouldn't call myself a Trekkie, but you know, I did I did follow a couple of series of Star Trek, um, and the uh, the one after the Next Generation, Deep Space Nine. Yes, they, they had a. They had a. Uh, speaking of trouble, they had an episode where they kind of went back in time to that episode where yes. Kirk actually yes. meets the Tribbles, and they're part. They're part of the crew, but they can't really be seen. You oh, know, that's uh, so cool. Yes, it, it was a very very cool episode. That one. Yeah. It was a very very cool that episode was a because cool episode. they they mashed some of the footage from the original episode as well. So they're talking to. Captain Kerr, right? And to them, of course, in their, their their universe, Kirk is already a legend. So mm-hmm. that's a pretty cool thing to to talk about. <laughs> well, that ended that. All the episodes. <laughs> on a, on a I, I loved all the episodes. I can tell you about my favorite episode of Stargate. Nobody cares about Stargate. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, guys, for being with us on the show. Uh, you can follow us at leftatvalley.com. You can follow us at, uh, on Facebook, on uh, Twitter, at LETV Podcast. So send us an email, leftatvalley at outlook.com. Send your complaints to Nancy on the third floor. <laughs> looking looking for and the hoaxes send hoaxes yes. and complaints oh yes definitely yes. send hoaxes and don't forget Easter weekend is the only time that Jesus gets hammered <laughs> <laughs> oh hey we gotta make those cookies oh yeah we were supposed to make those cookies we were supposed we? to make the hand cookies with the jelly in the middle that would be cool coming up Next weekend, we have singer-songwriter Shelly Siegel. That will be fun. Uh-huh. Yeah. And on the 14th, we'll have Crystal Child Jessica Schwab. I'm so, it's going to be so interesting. That's going to be Looking forward to, to that one. On the 21st, we have uh, Dr. Hector Garcia talking about the psychology of religious oppression. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And then on the 28th, at the end of the month, we have Ben Davis, and we'll be talking about nuclear power. Wow. Uh-huh. I got to call in for that one. Yeah. If I'm not right. here. Yeah. That's right. It's okay. We have Brad Dirks coming to replace you anytime. Yes, he's got to be his car replacement. Really? Yeah, awesome. <laughs> he wants to. <laughs> cool. Anything else? Can you say? Bon no. voyage to Scott. Yeah, Scott. Have a wonderful, See you tomorrow, buddy. Ah, wonderful a vacation. We'll miss trip. you. Stop and get that ice cream, man. Yeah. Oh, definitely, definitely. I might ask him if he'd do an interview with you. What the ice cream guy? The the guy who owns it. Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. See if I can contact. If you can, that'd be great. Do it. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Until next time. Ignorance, rather be alone than surrounded by damn idiots. As long as there's a price in my body, you can bet your last dollar. I'll be working hard fighting this problem. Religion is a disease. It comes from culture. Only true on a regional scale. Science is universal. Were you to say that Horus isn't real, but Jesus is? Or Zeus, Thor, or Mithra, Vishnu, you don't believe in them. I think the reason is apparent. You do what you told and believe in the God assigned by your parents. I'm proud to be an atheist, a skeptic, a non-believer, an infidel, a heathen. I call it how I see it. I say it's ignorance and you just call it faith and unsubstantiated claims. That's something to be ashamed. I'm an atheist. I'm an atheist. Now 
let me take a sec, don't mean to sound so hateful, but I swear to God, pun intended, I find it disgraceful. The thousands of children are raped by priests, and since they're holy men of God, they get away scot-free. And the Pope does his very best to keep it on the hush, don't want to affect business, he loves money too much. We know that they love the kids, but how the fuck can we protect them while they plan to molest them? We teaching them to respect them, respect them. The system is broke down, working backwards in the only action of tactic I plan to practice now is to attack them. The parties of God's hands are bloodstained, millions of murders by believers, and they're all in God's name. And let me take a sec, don't mean to sound so hateful, but I swear to God, unintended, I find it disgraceful. That many atheists are told to be quiet, you're not alone, speak your mind, time to let it be known. I'm proud to be an atheist, a skeptic, a non-believer, an infidel, a heathen, I call it how I see it. I say it's ignorance and you just call it faith and unsubstantiated claims, that's something to be.